Y'all. <laughs> Don't start with y'all. <laughs> I fucked up. You will fuck up in the future. Walker Percy, author of The Movie Goer, is a white guy. Thought he was black. Not sure why. Hello and welcome to How to Win the Lottery Season 4 now. Ooh, wait. Four? Four. Four. Is yeah. it four? Are we counting the, the, the state modules as, as seasons? Is it three and a half or is it four? iTunes, Apple Podcast. I'm so sorry. Does not allow for fractions. Suck shit, Sufjan Stevens. Bob cracking open a tall boy. 22 ounces of hard liquor. Not Bob. <laughs> Tulsa. A, are you Tulsa or you Shreds? Who are you Tulsa? Tulsa. Tulsa. Uh, yeah, it was a four loco, actually. Cool. The old school before it got banned? Or? Yeah, I, I, yeah, when... Like, the thing is, in 2009, uh, nine, when that was happening, I went down to uh, the liquor store and yeah. I brought up all the Four loco. I saw it coming and it's been in my basement. I have, I have like, probably like, I'm running low. I probably only have like 30 to 40 cases of Four loco left. That's not many. Yeah. Well, considering I... You drink at least three every yeah, episode I drink, of this. I drink three or four. Yeah. And, and... That's how you keep your energy so high. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> you bet. Um, you know that it was my senior class at Ramapo that was one of the two reasons that got banned, right? Like me and Charlie, our class that we graduated you got with, got four logo banned. Not me personally. Yeah. But the first week of the school year, we're doing the movie goer by by Walker Percy. I almost called him Percy Walker. I um, did that the other day when explaining what book I was currently reading to someone. The first week of school in September 2009, this is a, I'll, I'll tell a quick version of the story. We did a zombie walk. Our TV station did a zombie walk. We go around. The Beatles rock band comes out at on 9909 at midnight. So me and a friend go to pick it up. We come back and our section of campus, the village, as you know, because you used to teach at the school, um, or you used to attend the school. How many breadcrumbs do we like. want to leave? <laughs> Whatever you'd like. Uh, and there were just cops everywhere. We're like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. And we found out the next morning that like four kids had to go to the hospital because they not overdosed on Four loco, but like they got too drunk on Four loco. And it was Ramapo and one other school in New Jersey that like the same 72 hours or basically. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just like, oh, we can't do this anymore. Like this is the beginning of the school year. And they're like, we can't do this Four loco stuff. Yeah. The thing is like it, if we had just let Four loco keep going – it was. It came out and it was banned in such a short period of time that no one really learned how to drink it. Yeah. So, like, if we had let it keep going, things could have calmed down and we could have had this awesome drink that both, like, brings you to the edge of a heart attack and gets you really drunk. I mean, is it really that different than, like, a Red Bull vodka? No, it's not. It's not. It's just, like, you know. Uh, it's just easier to make and easier to find and it cheaper. It, and it's in those Arizona iced tea style cans that, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, those those cases are really heavy. I'm yeah. Sick a lot of them back maybe i'll sell my here's what i'm gonna do when i finish the four locos that's when i'm gonna sell my house oh because i don't want to bring them up and down out of the basement oh, I'm, I not thought gonna, you were I'm not gonna move them i thought you were saying you're gonna sell like the empty cans no no, no, no you're gonna, sell, I'm gonna sell my house i've been trying to i'm thinking about selling my house so once i'm finished with all the four locos that I'm makes sense sell my house. yeah because that's like most of your possessions yeah i have that i have like a little uh stick with a handkerchief tied around it to make it into a bindle, <laughs> a bindle. <laughs> that i keep my uh that's where i keep my um uh, your goods my goods yeah mm -hmm. my, my goods do you remember so this episode's coming out in february uh -huh. but happy new year everyone we're recording on new year's yeah, eve yeah i have i have another new year's resolution um my new year's resolution is to make ten thousand dollars in gambling on basketball by the end of the year by the end of 2023 by the end of 2023 okay i got a little bit of a jump start on it yeah i mean i think you earned it yeah that's like your seed money yep so that well my seed money is the is the sperm that i sell uh because i'm <laughs> Because you have no money other than your four loco. Well, because I'm six two, and they they need tall babies. Are those books real? Where like a woman will like flip through and be like, "Oh, he's college educated. He's six two. Like they don't know your name or your picture, but like, oh, he's got you know. There's no history of family illness. Um, he's educated. He's good with words. He won a spelling bee. I want that sperm. Is that a, is that a, are those uh, books real? I, I don't know because I've never actually uh, tried Selected to sperm. get sperm from a from a place. But but uh, I will tell you that when you go to the website to donate sperm, they make you fill out a thing, and and it's like there's preferential things for people who are like taller than six foot. And is this like real? That. Yes. Okay. We started this year on January first, twenty twenty two. So last year for you listener, 
recording a podcast. I don't remember what episode that was, but I do remember that we started watching the I Know What You Did Last Summer TV series on Amazon. <laughs> that was a year ago. That was a year ago. That yeah, was January that, 1st of this year. That show sucked. We are book. <laughs> <laughs> We are bookending the year with Lotto Pod. Uh, we that we were in season two, I think. Then campus novel, some campus novel we read. Yeah. And now we are in the suck shit Sufjan Stevens module number one, state module Louisiana. Do you want to give the listeners a refresher of what this, why we're doing this? I think you I, because it's just a method to tell Sufjan Stevens to suck shit. Mm-hmm. We're we're taking uh, all fifty United, all fifty two. Um, 50 states plus Washington and Puerto Rico. Um, and then we didn't get into the woods with things like Guam. I know some people requested that and and sent really vicious emails calling me a racist and things like that because we didn't include Guam. Especially since that episode is not out for a couple of months. But yes, we got, we got <laughs> wild at advance. No, the, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of stuff that could have been included because we did I did decide to include Puerto Rico and, and D.C. But um, it just would have ended up getting out of hand. We did talk about doing one for every country after this. And then I realized if we do just the one every two weeks, which feels like you can't really go. Like, even if this were our full time job, I don't know how much faster we realistically could go. It would take decades to yeah. get through this and the countries. It's 222 countries or something like that. Yeah. We're, we can just do the United Nations of Benetton. That was a failed campaign, right? I, I, yeah, I don't know. I remember when. Um, I remember. <laughs> We're so off topic. I remember when this is the better part of the episodes. Though. I, I remember when John Mayer gave an interview, and he was talking about how he only likes white women, only likes to date white women. And he said, "I have a Benetton heart and a David Duke dick." <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, it's pretty terrible. But it's pretty good. What a yeah! What the fuck is there's with a that childish guy? Gambino why, lyric? Why did he think that he could say that in an interview and nobody would be mad at him? Uh, because he's John Mayer. <laughs> he's in the film Vengeance, written and directed and starring B.J. Novak uh, as John Mayer. Believe it or not, he's got the range to play himself on screen in a party yeah. at the beginning of the movie. But here we are talking about the movie go by Walker Percy. All three authors in this module, I think, white men. All three definitely dead. Uh, Walker Percy's black. Never mind to the first one. <laughs> Dead, though. Dead, yeah. Tulsa, what is the moviegoer about? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? It's- <laughs> no, it's about, a, it's about a, a, a Korean War veteran um, who is uh, a person who maybe like yourself um, – Is that a dig? No, 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 no. Maybe like myself, maybe like a lot of people in this world um, sort of has come to to find comfort or to view the world through the lens of of, uh, film um, in some ways. And in other ways, it's a lot like uh, when I was reading it, I was thinking of – I was wondering what your reaction to it would be because the book that it reminded me most of the books that we've read is Open City. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it's that but good. Oh, interesting. Okay, I love okay. this book. Yeah, I, yeah. I really, really okay. love this. I think it reminded me of the NUI wink. Um, <laughs> Keep going. I'm not going to clear. I'm not going to clear up that that's a joke. I'm just going to let people think you're stupid. It reminded. <laughs> it reminded me a lot of books like Story of My Life and stuff, where uh-huh. it's a lot of the kind of books that I really love about just a young. Although he's much older, I think that's kind of interesting. He's not much older. He's thirty. He's 30 yeah, but I mean, much 30. older than like a lot of those books that I read specifically that you had me read about like. 18 to 22 year old white girls in New York, basically. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And I think that there's there's, a, that's a, that's like a huge genre of that I love. And in, 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 yeah, like exactly. a lot of the Brett Easton Ellis adjacent stuff. And I really, really like the sense of like, because, you know, I would say that I, I have had a not to brag, a successful life, but I also have no idea what I'm doing. And I feel like lost and kind of adrift at times. And like, yeah, I don't know if I've been successful at like anything I've done. It's just like, it's one of those, I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that this was an interesting way to frame that. And I also think it ties into a couple other things that I have watched coincidentally or not so coincidentally recently. Like there's the movie after sun. Have you seen after sun? Nope. Do you know about after sun? A little bit, but it's about like a guy who's turning 31. He's an 11 year old daughter. And he's just like, I don't know what I'm doing. And like, it's the same kind of where it's just like, yeah, to the world, you're, you know, you've re- co-parented this daughter and she's turned out really well. And like, you still feel like lost in a drift. And I think that this is a really interesting thing. But yeah, him just like wandering around, just like looking for God or meaning or purpose or whatever. 
I did not like Open City very much at all, and I love yeah. this book. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I think. May, do you think maybe that's because the things that he finds God or validation in are si- are more similar to the things that you find God and validation in than than Open City? Yeah, maybe. I also it's 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 sort of surprising how kind of few movies he sees. Like for a movie called for a book called The Movie Goer, yeah, right, right, I right. sort of expect like so. There's like the Kiss of the Spider Woman, which you had me read before mm-hmm. starting the podcast, and like that is almost literally just like four long retellings of movies and i kind of based on the title assume that this would be something not like that but yeah. and it's not like he goes to see a couple of movies and like doesn't even talk about them he just like and he'll like he'll reference things or remember things or relate to things in certain ways but like for the most part he just kind of sees like a normal amount of movies or even maybe less than you know most normal people see now i don't know like it's it seems like he's finding purpose in the cinema but like he's also just looking for it in New Orleans. Yeah, there's interesting stuff about like um and and correct me if I'm getting anything anything wrong here because as I as I told Joey before we started, I I read this book and I'm having a uh behind the, pull back the curtain. I'm having like a very busy slash brain muddled slash depressive time uh in my in my life right now and, and and I was just like when I was reading it I was like I like on a sentence by sentence level cannot put anything together. So like Joey's going to be doing a lot of the a lot of the uh, heavy lifting this episode just because I think he understood the book a lot better than I did. But um, there is the, there is the thing there about the certification of cities and the way that like we recognize a place as being a place, like a place that almost doesn't become official until we see that place yeah. in, inside cinema. Yeah. And so like New Orleans becomes official, like when you can recognize street corners in, yeah. inside film. And it made me think of that movie, um, Los Angeles Plays Itself. Which is great. Yeah, one of the best movies, like one of my favorite movies of the last uh, 20, 30, whatever It's years. like a three-hour documentary just like recapping every time that Los Angeles has been in a movie, basically. And, and, and yeah, and the ways that the architecture of the city mm-hmm. like influences how like uh, it's mostly like – um, what is it like villains that own modernist houses and things like that? Like there's, there's a certain type of villainy to a certain kind of architecture and things like that. But, but it, it made, yeah, that, I, I thought that was interesting in that, like um, in a, in a, in a way that very much relates to our previous module picks or it didn't happen kind of like mm-hmm. the validation comes through. It's being recognized in sort of this mode of popular culture rather than in the lived experience of the people who yeah. are wandering those streets every day. And, and so like, that's fascinating to me that when, when they, when he was talking about that, but that's like, you know, that's a small part of, of the book, but like somehow that part glommed onto my brain and stuck. Well, I think, I think, other. I think it makes sense to that it stuck because it is like central to the title, right? Like it's like whenever, yeah, whenever sure. movies come mm-hmm. up, it's like, Oh, like this is, this feels important, even if it's not right. Yeah. I also think it's like, this is refreshing. Like it almost couldn't be more different. I mean, you could do like a Jane Austen thing or whatever, but like even that's similar to in ways to the the season we just did. But this is like in 1961 or whatever, there's basically no technology of any kind of note. Like there's transportation in movies and that's about like everything that's not like just walking around and talking. And it was nice to sort of do like such an about face from yeah what we had right, been reading for sure for sure. So you had not read this before, no. How did you? Because this is I, I think it's on list of like the hundred best novels of the twentieth century and like mm-hmm. you know a, a quintessential Southern. Had you read anything that he'd written or like where did this come from? No, I, it's a book that I've I've heard about for a long time. I don't know if I knew that it was a Louisiana thing beforehand or if just like when I was looking, like I did a lot of looking for like quintessential novels mm-hmm. of, of an era and then like sifting through those to try to figure out not an era an area um and then trying to figure out like which one of those would actually fit and then this seemed plot wise and and like seriousness wise um something that might be up our uh collective alleys did you like i know that you're in a weird mental space but do you like it overall yeah i yeah i did i mean i think you know on it's interesting because the the like if you were going to rewrite this book now Mm mm-hmm with like a current aesthetic on a sentence by sentence level, it would, I don't want to say be dumbed down, but it would be like flattened out yeah. or like made into much more contemporary colloquial language. Whereas like the language in this is pretty academic, pretty like mm-hmm. uh, highfalutin. And then, and then it like moves between that and much more casual um, language, like one part that really made me laugh was like, there's like maybe a paragraph or two where it keeps saying like, 
Greg Peckishly, Gregory Ashley Peckishly, and like he, he there's like multiple variations on mm-hmm. on, on mm-hmm. Gregory Peck, um, and and so like it's also uh, like the language in it also, is also playful in a really interesting way. I think it's fun, and I think I think it took. This might just be because I have a dumb brain, but I think when I start a new book, I think it's the same thing like with a TV show or a video game or something like the first it takes longer than I would like for me to learn how to experience the thing. Yeah. And this because we just what I just said before, so much of what we just read for the last basically six months has been written in the last five years ish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's all not written like they're all wildly different, but like they're all written in the same time frame time era with the same references with the same whatever and the style is different but it's all like the same and then this is 60 years old and my brain's just like oh i'm gonna have trouble with this and then like once after say yeah it's a real 10 down, pages or yeah. whatever i was just like oh okay I'm, I'm into it now it's a real downshifting of gears right this is a much more slow moving book and that's sort of part of why it it I, I thought of it like Open City, but also because of like the Derive stuff, the him wandering mm-hmm. and searching for meaning among uh, things that w- we, not we, but like regular people, um, like might, you and might me. not necessarily like we. find uh, find meaning in. Yeah, but yeah, I meant we, but like not just you. Yeah, 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 I know. A broader, a broader. I'm thing. just saying we're normal people. Yeah, we're men of the people. I do think that this is also I'm ordinary. God damn it. I like how New Orleans it was and how Louisiana mm-hmm, it was, mm-hmm. even though. So, like, did you read the afterward or no? There's like a five uh, page afterward. No. So it's written by this guy. <clears throat> I think it's a guy. I got, you know, his race wrong. Yeah, Paul Eli, E L I E, mm-hmm. L E A, maybe. Who knows? Um, but he talks about how it's like a quintessential Louisiana and New Orleans novel. Yet he leaves the town yeah, for Mardi Gras. Goes to Chicago, right? It's a quintessential like Catholic novel where it's mm-hmm. a guy who doesn't believe in mm-hmm, religion. Mm-hmm. He's trying to figure out if he believes in God or not. It's like all these things that are very clearly like, oh, it's a Louisiana novel about Mardi Gras. And it's like, yeah, but he's not in town for that, and he doesn't believe in God. It's just like, well, because you access stuff through what it's not. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know if that's like that's a confusing thing to say, but I was. This is something that I was talking with uh, uh, with Meg about. A couple weeks ago, because she was reading The Exorcist, and The Exorcist is a book that people... Is she cheating on us with other books? <laughs> the Exorcist is a book that people got really pissed off about, like, especially Catholics, got really, really, really pissed off about it, because it is, like, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of, like, profane imagery and, sure. and stuff like that in it, but it's like, you could not find a more Catholic book than The Exorcist, right. which is about God defeating the devil, yeah. right, through, like, this mm-hmm. sacred <laughs> ritual of, <laughs> and and, like... So, like, if a, any Catholic that I think I, – I, I imagine this to be true. Any Catholic that took the time to actually read that book would come away from it with, like, an emboldened sense right. of spirituality. Um, but, like, it does that through accessing things like evil and the devil and stuff like that. So, I, I like, like to, make, to draw this connection back to the, the text, it's like, you know, to make a novel about New Orleans – you you almost have to walk away from something like Mardi Gras maybe because Mardi Gras is especially now at this point like it's all heard language man we know Mardi Gras right like, we know yeah. what that is yeah. we've seen it um that's like an outsider's view mm-hmm. of, of Louisiana it's like saying it's like it's like saying like how could you write a New York novel and not include the M and M store in Times Square <laughs> like that's that's New York baby that's what it is. Um, well, like that. So when I was in the airport last week, uh, making friends with people at the gate because we were there for eight hours before the flight got canceled, there was a couple who I'm assuming canceled their trip, but they were going to New York for two days. I was like, "You going for New Year's?" So he's like, "No, just for two days." So I'm just like, "Why? All right." But he was staying in Times Square. I was just like, "Oof!" Like that's <laughs> that's New York, but it's not New York. And there's a guy behind me, just like because he's like, you know, I want to make sure I get pizza and a bagel and like Chinese food or whatever. Like I need to like the New York things. The guy's like, "Yeah, go up to 175th Street." I'm just like. You're gonna send this guy into the heights, like yeah. from time, like this. That's Cor- not the Cor- city. Cornet Street Pizza, enormous slices. <laughs> that's what he was offered. That's what he said. And I'm like, yeah. this dude does not want to take the like a train way uptown, like yeah. spend 55 minutes. No, he, he wants. He wants to. He wants to eat at the Bubba Gum Shrimp mm-hmm. in, in, which is fine. Like whatever. I'm not like a New York. Right. I'm. I'm. I'm not like. Like frankly, fuck New York. I have no. I. I don't like New York. Well, I, so so friend of the show Montez, who was on our yeah. when when we helped. When they when she helped pick, I think she helped pick season two theme. Uh-huh. Um, she's going to New York for the very first time in her life in January. Yeah, so she was already there. <laughs> but she's like, 
I need, I need, I want to make sure that like, I like see the good things. I'm just like, I have no idea. Like my idea of New York is like, okay, there's a concert I'm going to at this venue. I'm going to find a cool thing within three, like three blocks of it. And then all that information leaves my brain. And I don't remember the bar. I don't remember the yeah, burger yeah, place. Yeah, 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 yeah. And like, I don't need to know because I don't live there and I'm not like going there on a regular basis. But like, I'm a terrible tour guide of New York because that's not so that, you know, even though I've lived within an hour of it almost my entire life. Yeah. I remember when I was in Los Angeles, this guy asked me, um, like a guy that I worked with was like, oh, I'm flying. I'm flying into New York. What should I do? And I was just like, get on a plane and leave New York. <laughs> <laughs> like that place sucks, man. Like I, I, I get like it's you know, there's culture there, right? There's Broadway and there's music. Are we gonna relitigate the tub talk conversation of why cities are terrible? <laughs> no, I'm I I don't mind. I mean I I'm a you know, n- notably against people. I don't I I like I, I don't like crowd. I, I don't like I get that crowds. Yeah. I I don't like uh, uh, I'm claustrophobic, so I don't like being in large groups of people. But like. I'm also no. I, I I prefer Philadelphia to New York. Like I I like Philadelphia a lot. It's much more my speed. Well, because you don't want to die when you drive there, right? And like you get there, and like there's parts of Philly that feel like New York, but like there's also parts of Philly that like don't feel like anything in New York. And it's yeah, no Philly. Philly's Philly's yeah, Philly's better. What I do like about the whole yeah, like let's sort of the hatred of other cities or like you know contempt of other cities or whatever is that like he spends a lot of this novel, the main character Binks. Uh, sort of shit talking other places mm-hmm. and it would feel sort of disingenuous if he spends his entire time in new orleans because it doesn't feel like he really loves new orleans he just hates other places yeah and then he goes to chicago at the end and he's just like oh yeah this place sucks um <laughs> and like i like chicago too by the way chicago's keep, cool keep <laughs> but but i think it like you know he it might not be a fair assessment but i think it's more fair than if he had spent his entire time because he's like i don't want like i just kind of want to like be where I, I feel comfortable i feel like comfortable in, in this one specific part of new orleans but I think it, I think it, it makes it even more Louisiana in that he leaves it, and it's just like, oh yeah, I don't want to be here. Yeah. Do you know that? Do you know that? Like, there's like a, a quote from On the Road, uh, like a, the Jack Kerouac novel that is like made into posters all the time, and it's like the only ones for me are the mad ones, the ones that shine bright mm-hmm. like sparkles into the night. Like, there's a quote in this book that I, that I love that was basically essentially the opposite of that quote, where he's like. Uh, and, and it feels very contemporary. It feels very like of the current moment where he's basically like the only ones for me are the haters, the people, that, the people that completely hate everything. Like they're the only people that are interesting to me at all. I took a picture of that because I love that so much. Well, there, yeah. So there's like the page before that. He's talking about like, this is kind of like where he's in, like a more of a depressive state or whatever. And he just says, for some time now, the impression has been growing upon me that everyone is dead. He's just like, there's no life. Everybody, everyone sucks. And then the next page says, there's another thing about the world, which is upside down. All the friendly and likable people seem dead to me. Only the haters seem alive. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's so good. <laughs> yeah, the only, like, the only thing that's interesting is when people hate shit. All the friendly people have nothing to say. And, like, he doesn't seem particularly hateful. He just sort of seems, and, then, and, like, I don't think aloof is fair either. He's just like, I'm just kind of getting by. Yeah, he's, he's, he's. Maybe that's another thing that attaches me to to Open City with this book is that he feels um, there's like a flat, detached sense of, of mm-hmm. self in this book where he he, does, he is like drifting yeah. th- through things. To the point where even like his cousin Kate. Yeah, I'm, tries- I was going to say walk us through it plot wise because he starts with his aunt, right? And, and his aunt is like – your cousin Kate's having a breakdown yeah. or something like that. So yeah. like the, the back of the novel describes this as like a guy, like it seems like he's like in swingers. He's like casual sex and movies, man. That's all this guy mm-hmm. does. And like, that's not it. He's like basically a serial monogamous kind of, and is always with his secretary. Yeah. And then when the relationship sours, cause it always sours, she leaves. He lights, he writes her like a nice recommendation and gets another secretary who he soon quickly beds. And so it's not like he's just like going out like on Tinder or like 1961 version of Tinder and like yeah. has a different girlfriend every night or whatever and seeing a movie every night. He's just a serial monogamist. And so he's got – there's only like a handful of characters. Like there's not very many characters that actually matter. There's Binks and there's Kate and there's the aunt. And then there's some other people that like come in and out like Sharon, his secretary, who's kind of important but ultimately not really. Like she's just kind of not Kate. Yeah, she's not a full, fully – fully drawn character in the way that Kate is. Yeah. But this, his aunt or his great aunt is the one he spends the most time with sort of, you know, they, they ebb and flow their relationship. And we learn about Kate that the, the best moment of her life was after yeah, her she, fiance yeah. died and she was in the car going home. She's like, Oh, basically I'm free. Like I didn't yeah, want yeah. that. Like I'm yeah. Which feels 
so honest, but also uh, like in 1960 or any time, just be like, oh no, like you're broken. But it's like, no, that feels like a good thing. So I liked, I, I appreciated that kind of characterization of it. Yeah. And he's traditionally been the one that comes and helps Kate out when she's having yes. tough times, right? He's like five years older than her and it seems like historically he's the only one who can kind of get through to her. And toward the middle-ish, end-ish of the novel, she tries to kill herself. And then, like, the next day he's supposed to go to Chicago. She's like, can I come? He's like, Which is also, like, let's talk briefly about her because because Meg and I talked about this a little bit too, um, which is this idea uh, – this like pro suicide idea that exists in the book where they're essentially just like, look, like the only thing I'm not going to kill myself, but like one of the comforts that I take on a day to day basis is that I have the option to right. kill myself. And then they say something like if I didn't have the option, then I would actually do it. But yeah, like yeah, having yeah. the option yeah. is the only thing that keeps me alive. Yeah, basically there, there's, there's, there's a paradox, uh, afoot and there's something, um, you know, I've heard that I've heard people say, that. I think that was something that Hunter S Thompson said, uh, that and, like, then he and then himself. he eventually killed himself. And then he eventually killed himself. Yeah. This is, you know, it's, it's an idea that's been around, but it's always, it's still something that's always kind of jarring to see written down. Are there any Hunter S. Thompson books in any of the state modules? I'm going to let you use your brain for that one. And, and fear and, and loathing in <laughs> Reno, Nevada. <laughs> I mean, that's like the, that's the essential Vegas novel. Yeah. It's really, there, there's, you know. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, it might not be, uh, he also wrote The Curse of Lana, which is a Hawaiian novel. Ooh. Okay. Stench of Honolulu is on the Hawaii novel. I'm not saying. Where, where in the... I don't know. Is Carbon San Diego? Chief? Uh, where in the in the sequencing of like putting together states, was this an easier state to put together? Yeah. Did you do this earlier Louisiana? on? Louisiana? Yeah. yeah, easy. Piece of cake. Because I do like that we're starting off here. Like, this Lots of Louisiana like, novels. Um, I think that there is something beautiful. It might not be kosher. It might not be like, you know, cool to say, but I think there is something like... Ultimately, the pro-suicide message is just like, hey, life is beautiful. You should enjoy it. Or like you should find beauty in life and you should try to you know, mm-hmm. find things that you enjoy. Um, and if one of those things is like – if you like the idea that you could end it all um, – again, this is a, a murky road to go down. If you find beauty in that, like that's kind of cool in a way. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. But she doesn't kill herself. And then the next day, he's supposed to go to Chicago. And she's like, can I come? He's like, yeah, sure. I don't care. And then when they – then the aunt rightfully is just like – where did she go? What is happening? I mm-hmm. thought you were responsible for her. And like he, he's being good to her. It's just maybe not the best time to take her out of town, you know, within 24 hours of her trying to kill herself. Yeah. Then they get married. Right. Which feels. I think it's just normal back then. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like they're step cousins. Yeah. All right. But I don't know. Um, Okay, I got the the ethnicity of the author wrong. Is this a white story or is a black story? Or does it not really matter. Were you picturing these characters as white or black? I was picturing. Yeah, that's a good. That's actually something. That, I don't know. I mean, this might th- this. Yeah, because they talk about negro, like the yeah, word yeah, they yeah. use negro help and like everything like and that. And he has like conflicts in in like he has a conflict with his aunt's like servant or something like that mm-hmm. Mercer, right? Yeah. Like, like they have a very a very contentious relationship. No, I don't know. I, it, which is interesting because I don't think it, it's never he's never identifies himself as being a specific race, does he? No, and I think the fact that they identify, you know, drivers and servants and whatever as Negro. So he's writing a white character. I think so. Which is which is fascinating and um and always like Yeah, it's it's always interesting when an author makes a a, a main character uh a race outside of their own. It only really works. I, I, like I'm not sure that white people can do it. Um, like they, they 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 probably can. Like a skilled a skilled writer. I'm not saying they don't have permission to do it. Like they you can do whatever you want with writing. Right. But it's like the reason why minorities or or marginalized groups or uh, women um, can write white male main characters is because like those narratives are ones that like are thought of as being like. Pop culture narratives. And I also, they're not as they, – they, 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 the nuances are not like specific because it feels like we've made that the main story. You know? Yeah, there's also something like to 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 elaborate on that further, take that in a different angle. Like we've all seen 10,000 stories about straight white dudes. That's, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And so like they've learned how to tell that kind of story. But like uh, how many like stories have we read about like queer black women? Like maybe three. Yeah, and so like a like a white guy trying to replicate that voice right. feels like very very treacherous. Right. Not that they. I mean, you can do it, but it would. It, it's like 
you, the likelihood that you're going to fuck something up is, is, high. is like much, much, much more. Do you think in writing a white story, is he commenting on anything or is he just, because again, I didn't think about this, the race at all, because again, the privilege that I have, I'm just, every book that I read, like, I'm just like, oh, it's a white dude. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I don't, I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about that at all, actually. So when, when, when reading. So were you picturing character or actors in, cause they were, I, I texted this to you that Terrence Malick was trying to adapt this in the eighties. And then after Katrina, he said, I don't think that new Orleans exists anymore, which I think any city hurricane national disaster, natural disaster aside, 25 or 30 years later, it's going to be wildly different anyway. And this is when he was adapting in the eighties, that's 25 or 30 years after the book came out. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, I don't think it takes a hurricane to irrevocably change a city. Mm -hmm. but I don't know. You know, do you think this could be adapted? Were you picturing anybody in the roles? I wasn't. Um, uh, let's pause for one minute. Yep. So the breaking news. Into <laughs> Breaking news in the pod. We should, we should no. I, I don't even know. Like, should we just erase everything and go? Not erase everything, but I don't know. Um, Walker Percy not black. <laughs> I thought this whole time that Walker Percy was black. So there's no commentary. I don't think we need to. I don't think we need to revise anything because we just, you know. Yeah, I I th I don't know why I thought that Walker Percy was black. I don't know. It's fine. That's so strange. Why? Like, like I, I, huh. So did you have like an ink? Cause you like, we, we paused the pod for you to look it up. Did you have like an inkling? You're like, maybe I'm not right. Yeah. Like I, I was, I was like, let's like just double, did like double, triple check this. And then, I, and then you look at this picture on Wikipedia and you're like, that guy could be a really light skinned black guy. With, like a guy with a tan, but no, he looks, he looks white. Yeah. So are uh, the other novels that we're reading this module, are any of them written by black men? Robert no, Penn Warren no, or John no, Kennedy Tool? No, no. So I think that's, you know, not necessarily a shortcoming. It's but whites I, all the way down. I feel like New Orleans is a, not famously is the wrong word, but like a very black city. Like a lot of cities are black. Yeah, it's a but super, like super, super diverse city. A history yeah. of jazz and the history of, you know, black uh -huh. culture. Uh -huh. Creole, et cetera. So I wonder if that's going to come into play. Because I mean, I think it, no three books will ever sum up an entire state, right? Also, yeah. we're not just doing New Orleans. We're doing all of Louisiana. Yes. So I don't know, but yeah, uh, my bad. We probably, I mean, if people actually care, they already turned the podcast off. We already got angry emails. So like, sorry, but you're not listening to this anyway. We'll throw a disclaimer at the top. There was a line in this book, Laro's Catch Medlows. Did you see that or no? Laro's Catch Medlows. L-A-R-R-O-E-S Catch M-E-D-L-O-E-S. And it was said something like, I think he's talking to Kate. Or maybe it's, no, it's just Sharon, I think. Mm -hmm. And he asked, like, he asked her information. She, she goes, Lara's Catch Medlows. And I'm like, is that like snitches get stitches? Is that like a thing? And there's a whole thing on theglobeandmail.com about that. Because when you search Lara's Catch Medlows, the first hit is about someone knowing a phrase from a different phrase, reading this book and being like, are they related? And they tried to like explore it. And it basically just means like, it's a thing that parents would say to their kids when they don't want to answer a question. Yeah. Which is like frustratingly vague and like doesn't actually explain what it means. But I just thought it was a very funny, like maybe it's a New Orleans colloquialism of like, I'm not going to tell it because snitches get stitches, but it's not that. It's just like, I don't want to answer a question. Yeah. But I took very few notes on this because I normally like reading the Kindle book. This is not available on Kindle. It's like highlighting things, like taking notes on it, whatever. And then when it's an actual physical thing, I just took pictures, but I'm like, I'm not going to transcribe the pictures of the text. So... You know, I have, he's about to turn 30, Laros Catch Medlows, and this feels like Open City. Those are my notes for this book. <laughs> I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you also thought that it felt like Open City. Well, because I think a lot of it's just him wandering around New uh -huh. Orleans, right? But not even like describing New Orleans. He's just kind of like, I'm trying to find meaning. I'm trying to find purpose. So how do you, how, how do you think of this book as being like a New Orleans novel? He frames his identity, I think, in where he lives. And we don't know a lot about him other than he's kind of aimless and he likes being in this place called Gentilly. Mm -hmm. And I think it's specifically like not the New Orleans you think of. And it, he even describes it, I think, early on as being not really New Orleans. Like it kind of looks and feels different. And I was more aware of that because I knew that we were doing a geography-based 
module, but yeah. I didn't take a picture of it. Yeah, it's in, I think the the like I think the modules that we do shape the way that we read things. Yes. So we're looking at, you know, how how this is an internet novel, how this is a campus novel, and now we're looking at how it is a Louisiana novel. Which is both good and bad. Yeah, yeah. It's going to drive us away from certain points of view and mm-hmm. drive us towards other points of view. Um, but I think one reason why that is, like, kind of interesting is because I don't know that it – I mean, this book might be different because people have – people do think of this as, like, a New Orleans novel. Mm-hmm. like. New Orleans novel, right? All caps. Um, so people have probably viewed it through that filter many times. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case with a lot of the novels that we look at. You know, I don't know what the essential Kentucky novels are um, or what novels capture Kentuckian identity more than more than others. But like any time that a novel takes place in a specific place, unless that author is doing it randomly and has never been there. In which case it takes on a thing like Kafka's America, where which that that's a book that we should actually read at the end of this, like to, to cap it all at the off. end of all fifty states. Yeah, because Kafka's America is insane because it's like like as Franz Kafka, like Metamorphosis. Kafka? Yeah, yeah, because okay. he never came to America. He he was never in America, and then he wrote a novel called America, and it's it's like there's like he has like you know enormous factories set in the middle of like open fields it, it, like he, he has it's like not any it, it's this like weird dreamscape version of america that's like pieced together from what he's heard well i think that's interesting like i remember hearing when steve mcqueen made 12 years a slave uh-huh. the thing the credit one of the main credits that i think people gave him was that like basically for century or you know for the history of cinema people been trying to tell like an accurate depiction of like what slavery was like and it took someone who didn't live here to actually kind of get it right in a way yeah um so i'm not saying that like kafka got america right but there's something i think valuable to an outsider's perspective where you're not warped by your own personal history with a thing well there's also like something that happens in cinema which is really interesting like there's this movie called the scarecrow which is a gene hackman al pacino movie from probably the really early seventies, maybe even late sixties. The film was, was the first time that the cinematographer was in America. Oh. And, and so you get this like version of America that looks, it's unmistakably America, but Mm -hmm. it also is like really strange looking Okay, and, and sort of like almost like a painted version of, of America because he's like viewing America for the first time through an, an artist's lens. Sure. And there's something really, really fascinating about it. And it's a beautiful movie. Um, and, and it like, you know, it's a lot of like windswept planes and like, you really get the sense of how cold the Midwest is. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there's like a lot of, a lot of beauty to that, that you, I think can only be delivered by an outsider in a certain sense. So there, there, yeah, there's something so fascinating about, about that, like, the insiders versus the outsiders perspective of places. Have you been to New Orleans or Louisiana at all? No. I'm assuming you would, you would like to go. Yeah. But also I I'm, it's maybe a little uh, too hot for me there. You can go off season. Yeah. The reason I ask is because I think there's, there's this like romanticism of like Europe. I think maybe just specifically where we live, like close enough to Europe where like it's relatively affordable to go there but I have a lot of friends who are like, oh, I want to go to London. I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Paris. I want to go. Like, I'm like, there's so many like cool places in this country that you can go to much easier and much more affordably than going to Europe. I'm, I'm not saying that like Europe's not cool because it's great. But I think that like there's something special. I think that's why I'm excited about this project that will take us until we're like 90 years old. Yeah. Well, you 90 and me 85. Yeah. Well, probably 85. You'll have to get a replacement for me before that. Yeah. Well, um, I'm planning on dying soon. Soon. <laughs> well, relatively. Soon. Okay, Kate. But I think there's something like, just like I, I do, like um, America is a complicated subject, but I think yeah, there's something very special about exploring your country. And I think this yeah. is a really interesting way to do it. And and I think something like we could do at the end of each of, each of these modules is like talk about like what- We can the, go there? Well, hmm. That'd be interesting. It'd be very expensive, but we could do that. I mean, it, how many of these are we going to get done in a year? One? No. So this will be three. The next season's 10. That's 13. That's half a year. So maybe two. Maybe two. Yeah, that's just two trips a year. A weekend trip. We could do it. That's actually doable. That's <laughs> doable. As as state two comes up in New Jersey, it's like, well, all right. Yeah, that's fine. We'll go spend the weekend in Wildwood. 
Cool. <laughs> we could do that. Yeah. Well, well yeah. Well, that's something we're. But what was your about. idea at the end of the module? What? Oh, I just think that we should talk about what you know how how these uh, books have shaped our like how we view this yeah. specific place. Because I think so. I went to. I've only been to Louisiana. Like I drove through it one time, but I was a decade ago. Well, now eleven years ago, as this episode comes out. Yeah. Um, I did a six and a half week cross country trip, and I was in New Orleans for two nights because a friend who did like the first half of the trip with me lived down there. And so we stayed with him, picked him up and, you know, went on our way, but it was really, really cool. And I, th- I feel like I saw so much of this country so quickly. Like I was in Seattle for like two and a half hours. I'm like, I've been to Seattle, but like I haven't really done anything in Seattle. Right. But I, what I found was that, and this seems so obvious in retrospect, like spending like a second night in the place really helps you like see the yeah. place and also having a friend there. Cause he's like, you don't want to go to Bourbon Street. You want to go to Frenchman Street. You don't want to do this. You want like you, there's like things that like you kind of have to do touristy things. Like we got beignets from Cafe du Monde. Like there's things that you go and you do, but then like you see a city through like a local's eyes and like do the things and it's cool. Like, and he lived in a place that like felt only like, like no other city I've ever been in. Like where there's just trees like overgrowing, like, like the city had almost like lost a battle to trees in a way, mm-hmm. which seems like no other city would like allow that. Like there's just like roots and stuff. What and city are we talking about again? New Orleans. Okay. What we're talking about? <laughs> no, you mentioned Seattle. I, I, oh I, no, no, I no, 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 no. New Orleans. Yeah. Um, I get. I don't remember if I saw any trees in Seattle. Yeah, I, I was. No. See, yeah, there. There are trees. It's in the Seattle. Pacific Northwest, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that there is something really cool to you know seeing a city, but also seeing a city. Like it's cool that this is not like. I think what the afterward brings up is that you think of New Orleans and like, oh, there's floats going down the street and it's a Mardi Gras. And I think there's, it's cool and there is value and there is merit to that not being the case. Yeah. I mean, I also think that like our view of it and, and maybe I, I, maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't include other people in that. My view of New Orleans has, is so shaped by Hurricane Katrina Mm -hmm. because that's like, you know, the primary like image that I have in my head, there there, there was right. like a whole year where yeah. every time you saw anything in New Orleans, New Orleans, it was like the Superdome collapsed and, and, you know, streets, the, the levees breaking in multiple Spike Lee documentaries mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. this and, uh, you know, Brad Pitt building houses and then getting sued for those houses falling apart or something. Yep. And, uh, uh, George Bush doesn't care about black people and, uh, streets flooding and, and, uh, the national guard, uh, like shooting at, at people who are, who are, uh, trying to get, uh, tr- trying to survive by taking bread from, from a shop, right. And, uh, people paddling down the street in, 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 uh, rowboats and all, and all these things like that's So shaped my vision of what new Orleans mm-hmm, is, mm-hmm. um, that that's like right side by side now with, with this idea of like elaborate costumes and beads and people showing their boobs and, um, you know, uh, Louis Armstrong and, and, uh, uh, that David Simon series and all of these, like all of these things that have like crashed together. But it's like, so for me, New Orleans specifically is this like incredibly tragic place that is like, right. has, has like these people, um, living there who, you know, they don't want to like, that's their culture. There's a, there's a very deep culture there, but it's also an incredibly dangerous place to live because, you know, it could flood at any at any right. minute and wipe everything out. And then you have you have these people who are already vulnerable now having to deal with yet another tragedy. And so like I look at New Orleans as being this like really fascinating mixture of beautiful culture and and uh art that has created a lot of the of of what we think of as the American experience versus like living on the precipice of disaster at any minute. But I think that there is, and I don't want to trivialize or like overstep because like I don't live there. I've never lived there. I probably will never live there. Um, not, you know, for any reason other than just like I probably won't live most places. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's just like the whole like suicide thing in the novel. Like I think that there is a certain kind of beauty to the fact that like it could all go away. Well, it's also it's also there, there's something beautiful to the to like the fuck you. I won't leave right. fact of it. Like they're, they're like, this is where it is. And like you can try it like no matter what happens, yeah. like we're going to stick it out. We'll stick through it. Um, there's like a real like Sisyphus aspect to that. That is like you can look at it as being beautiful. You could look at it as being stubborn. You could probably even look at it as being dumb. But there is um, I don't know. There's something really admirable about it. Well, I think that there is something that like and maybe it's the whole 
one death is a tragedy. Yeah. It, the reverse of one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. Like I feel like when you see like on the Weather Channel or whatever that there's like a hurricane in Florida – and there's just like one dude who's just like, I'm staying, I'm not. And like, I'm yeah. like what, a, what an idiot. But then like when a whole city does that, it's cool or it's like empowering. I think it's like the opposite where like instead of being like, that man is so brave, look at him. It's yeah. like, get out of there, man. But then you think about like, no, the entire city doesn't want to leave because like that's where their family is yeah. from. That's where they want like, their family rebuild. to be. This is our home. Right. So yeah. um, I'm very glad. I, I think that Louisiana is just like a cool state, and I think New Orleans is a cool city. And I'm just really glad that we that we're starting here. I think it's a really interesting yeah, place to I, start. I wish that I could have. Uh, I wish that my brain were in a better place for this book. But um, so thank you for for doing the heavy lifting. Sure. There. Uh, let's, you, let's do Meg's email. Do you have other thoughts or no? No, I think I'm okay. All right. Let's see Meg's email. We have an email address: lottery at cageclub.me. If you want to email in about this book or any book, we'll read it on the next episode we record after we get it, which might not be for months, but. We'll get to it eventually. I still think it's so cool that we got the person writing about <laughs> yeah, yeah. Patricia, mm-hmm. you know, on a first name basis. Um, he's not listening to this because only this is not about Patricia Lockwood, right? So yeah, well, we'll we'll throw a hashtag and pretend like it's partially about her anyway, just to get that one. Getting close to thirty k. Patricia maybe. Lockwood's the movie goer. <laughs> I also don't, you know, there's also Patricia Highsmith, and there's also like you know lots of good author Patricias. Meg's reaction to the movie goer. I like the movie goer, says Egg, but I wish I gave myself more time to read it more slowly. It was a very meditative novel, and I had to speed through parts of it. I told this girl three weeks ago when we were going to record. Yeah, it's the, you know. I do, I, there was something I appreciate, like I, I sort of rushed through the end, not rushed through the end, but like I forced myself to finish today before we recorded, but I, I read most of it on a recent flight, and like, there was something just like, I'm just going to do this. Like, I'm just going to like, I'm not going to speed through it because I have days and days and days. And then this morning I was just like, oops, didn't finish the book. Mm-hmm. Got to finish the book. But I think it's probably not better. It's not good to rush anything. Even, I mean, unless you're like voraciously consuming because you love it so much. Yeah. But Or unless you're Dale Earnhardt Jr. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that quote movie goer turned out to be some sort of philosophical state of being. This was shown by the fact that Binks described the one train passenger as, quote, a moviegoer, though, of course, he does not go to movies. I'm not sure if you guys have defined what you feel a moviegoer is. I don't. Do you? Go go ahead. Coming off of seeing Babylon this morning, my favorite film in five years, they talk about how, like, people go to the movies and sort of feel less alone. I feel like there's something, and I think, I was thinking about, like, how it's such a coincidence that, like, I just watched After Sun, I just watched Babylon, and there's these themes from both of them that show up here. But I'm like, there's not that many stories. I feel like searching for meaning and feelings of isolation are pretty universal things that are in most novels. And I think a moviegoer is just someone who's trying to maybe find peace, who maybe hasn't found peace and is trying to find it somewhere else, either through art or other people or anything, really. Yeah, I think there's an interesting... um paradox in that they they look for connection through being alone in the dark Ooh, yeah so they seek community they want to be a part of something but not engage with the thing maybe maybe yeah i mean i get that i, I look i go to the 90 percent of the time when i go to the movies i go to the movies by myself yeah. and i think that's a better experience mm-hmm. for the most part um it's it's easy to get lost mm-hmm there was like I think so much of an experience, especially for me in seeing a movie, is with the crowd that I'm seeing it with. And there was, you know, as they have done from time to time before Babylon, Margot Robbie and the other the the main dude who I had, don't know if I'd seen from other things come up. And they're like, "Thanks so much for seeing the, the way it was intended to be seen on the big screen with an energized crowd." And there's like eight people in the crowd. Did you say the mini dude? The other dude. The other main dude. The main dude. Okay. Main dude. Yeah, the mini dude. Um, but I'm just like, it's not really an energized crowd. And like, I was sitting next to these two women who like were sort of like whispering to each other. I'm just like, like, because they were like in their 70s. I'm just like, I, I just moved. Like in the first minute of the movie, I'm just like, I'm going to get away. And I went to the back of the theater and like the back row was just me and this one woman. And like, we were both like cracking up through like so much of it. And I'm like, this is like, this is cool. Like we're not, I'm not being dictated by, like, I'm not being told what to laugh at or what to cry at or whatever, but, like, we're finding joy in the same things. Yeah. And I think it's a really good experience. Like, I, I wish that, like, I was in, like, a, a really crowded room with people who, like, felt the exact same way as I do, but, like, there's a risk to that. Like, I... Well, the, the opposite experience is, um, I, may, I, I may have talked about this. One of the most alienating experiences of my life is that I went to go see uh, The Hangover 
by myself. Ooh. I went to go see that by myself, and it was basically a sold out crowd, and everyone was laughing mm-hmm. like really intensely. Yeah. And I was just like, I am so alienated by what these the people around me are finding to be funny because yeah. I'm not finding any of this to be funny. Right. And and like not only do I not find it funny, but I find it like kind of mean spirited and and like uh juvenile and and like i'm i'm like a pretty juvenile person mm-hmm. obviously like you've listened to to if you've listened to any of these podcasts like i i have very juvenile sense of humor etc cetera, etc cetera. but like something about that movie like really struck an alienating chord with me sure. i think it's because i was in a room full of people laughing yeah. at a bunch of shit that i didn't find funny at all and i think that's it's not the same experience but i've had two similar experiences to that when i saw knives out which i think is a fine movie like i don't think it's i, I don't love it the way that people love it but every time Chris Evans said anything, everybody cracked up. And I'm like, these aren't even jokes. Like they were just mm-hmm. like so enamored with him by being Captain America that they're like, everything he does is wonderful. And that just made me like the movie less. But the other time was when I saw Kick-Ass 2, objectively, I think a terrible movie. And the theater I was in gave it a standing ovation round of applause at the end. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. And I was like, did we watch the same movie? I can't, I, like I, there have been so few movies. That I can't even remember any movies that I've that I've been to that have gotten standing ovations at the end. And and the idea that like kick ass two might be yeah. one of them is really hilarious. Like I've seen like a lot of standing ovations at like film festivals and stuff, like where I understand because like there's people in attendance and like there's a real film nerd crowd and like they want to show yeah, off this performative. Yeah, yeah, but like yeah. this was just like a, a bunch of normal people who loved kick ass two so much that they felt the need with like whoever directed that movie. Um, it wasn't Matthew it, Vaughn. It wasn't Matthew Vaughn. Uh, they felt the need to stand up and applaud when it was over, and I was just like. That was maybe the worst movie I've ever seen. The crowd does a lot one way or the other, right? Yeah. So I think, yeah, well, how I would define a moviegoer is uh, essentially someone who uh, makes themselves alone in order to feel connection with other people. Yeah. In introverted extrovert, possibly. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. To me, Egg says, in defining a moviegoer, it felt like someone who was a passive observer. Even the phrase a movie watcher would have felt more active. To go to the movies implies watching the movie, but is also phrased in a way that the movie is something that happens to you rather than something you're doing. Yeah, that's interesting. The fact that there was a Kierkegaard quote at the very beginning made me wish that I had read either or <laughs> when we read the novel by the same name by Elif Batuman. Yeah. However, it did feel like it was clear that both Batman's book and the moviegoer were inspired by the same things. Okay. When Binks was talking to Nell and said to the reader, quote, I can talk to Nell as long as I don't look at her, looking into her eyes is an embarrassment. It reminded me of when Selen said something along the lines. The fact that she remembers anything about either or is so impressive. You don't remember anything about it? I don't remember mo- things about most things. Okay. When someone says something along the lines of feeling the, quote, weight of sadness of being alive when looking at another person, I can't think of the exact quote, though, and I'm not sure it's from the idiot or either or. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, there's definitely, like, this novel is existentialist, and, mm-hmm. and Kierkegaard is is the father of existentialism, right? Um, and also, this novel is ca- Catholic, and Kierkegaard is, like, notoriously Catholic, right? A very, very, like... Um, and and the the sort of collision of those two philosophies creates some creates like a dialectic that's really um really neat mm-hmm. um because with existentialism you're you're essentially i don't i don't need to go over what existentialism is keep keep, keep going <laughs> no but i also think that like you know she's she's saying that you know that walker percy and elif batuman were inspired by the same things like i saw sort of the not the inverse of it, but like I saw things like story of my life or like open city or like other things that we have read or discussed or just, you know, tangential to the podcast, seeing something like this and being like, that inspires me to do a thing. Like, it's kind of like finding your favorite band's favorite band or whatever, like Kierkegaard, the trail, like Bachman might be pulling from that, but also she might be pulling from this too. Right. Cause it's the same kind of, yeah. It felt like Binks made a shift from the quote, aesthetic life to the quote, ethical life. Look at egg. A plus on this one. He was passive in both parts of his life, but after getting yelled at by his aunt, almost pronounced it aunt, and I don't know why. I felt very self-conscious there for some reason in my head. He ended up just doing what he was told for the betterment of his family. There's no real explicit discussion of happiness or satisfaction. It felt like Binks was just doing whatever he felt he had to do, whether to further his search or at the behest of his family. I think it's the aimless thing, right? He's just like, I don't know what I want to do. I'll just do whatever. Yeah. um, Can you explain more 
explicitly the content, the, the, the concept of, of searching as, as this novel lays it out. Cause that's like sort of an important thing in the beginning of the book. So I think I took it as he's just, he doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. And his aunt wants him to become a doctor because he's got like this specific brain. Like, it seems like he's just kind of like lazy. And she's like, no, you got a brain for research. He's like, I only did research because like, I didn't want to do anything else. And like, I was fine. Like it just, whatever. He's a, he's also a successful stockbroker, right? Yeah. But it's like a family business. So like he didn't like earn that maybe, you know, Nebo baby, classic behavior. But yeah, the searching, I think, is just trying to find not meaning as much, but meaning also, but just like what he wants to do with his life. Like he's 30 and like they talk about in the, maybe the novel, I think definitely in the afterward about like by that point, because they talked about like comparing to like, you know, Catch on the Rye and like Holden's like, you know, 15 or whatever and just like it's okay to not know what you're doing by that point. But like when you're 30, especially in the sixties, like you should be married with a good job and like kids and whatever. And like, you should have your shit figured out. And he doesn't, I think he's just trying to figure out like, is there more like, or is this enough? Okay. Right. Is that what you, is that? Yeah. Would you add anything to that? No, or no, no, no. I think it's, I remember Bobby talking this is still a very long email, still more. I remember Bobby talking about how the point of Kierkegaard's either or was that it didn't matter didn't matter whether you lived an aesthetic or ethical life if you didn't have religion. Not having the background of that novel made it hard for me to parse what Percy was critiquing. I don't think he's critiquing anything. I actually mm-hmm. I see it kind of as like empathetic in a way. I don't know. Uh, because religion definitely played a part in this novel in some way. Like it was mentioned but not practiced, which we kind of talked about a little bit before. The mention of Ash Wednesday as connected to Mardi Gras at the end felt very poignant. I think that it'd be interesting to read this alongside The Winter of Our Discontent by Steinbeck, which also uses Ash Wednesday as a kind of device to make commentary about morality. I would love to read Winter of Our Discontent. Uh, have you read it before? Yeah, that's a great, it's a great book. Um, yeah, I'd have to reread it to to comment meaningfully on on the comparisons between the two. But that, that's that's an interesting juxtaposition i don't think that she's wrong in that like he might be using it to comment on things but i think it might just be like all these people like he talks about multiple times there's like the 98 percent of america feels like this statistic has radically changed in the 60 years since it came out but 98 percent of america believe in god and two percent are agnostic or atheist he's like i don't know where i belong like i'm not, i'm in neither of those camps and i feel like maybe he's commenting on religion but i think that when he sees people going in and getting the ash on their forehead just like i don't belong there like i'm just i'm still an outsider yeah i don't know if it's necessarily like religion he's commenting on but just that the outsiderness and the trying to find a community yeah i think also that 98 percent statistic is interesting because like i think you'd still find like things, it's, it's higher than we would think that. yeah because because i i think it's probably like the amount of people who identify as christian versus the amount of people who act like who practice Christianity are completely different. Sure. Those numbers are, are, you know. I also think that like there are places in this country you could go where it's like a hundred percent. Yeah. And there's like, like, I think we're also skewed by the fact that we live in like coastal elite tower where it's just like, we're too smart to believe in that or whatever, even though that's not. I mean, I don't, I live in, I, I live in a place that's like not like that. You're, I, th- I feel like you're identifying us as New Yorkers. Whereas like, I think, I, I think we're, no, I think what I'm trying to identify us, identify us as is living near enough to a cynical enough place yeah. that it's easy to dismiss all religion just right. like as like the default, like the starting point. Cause I have, it, it's like, I, New Jersey is such an interesting place because it's like, you know, it, it, to the rest of the country, it looks like a blue state because it votes, it tends to vote for democratic presidents. And then we end up with. Republican governors. And, 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 and sometimes we have, you know, we have democratic senators and stuff like that, but that's because Patterson, Newark, Trenton. Uh, well, that's the same thing of like every state that basically yeah. votes blue, right? Yeah. So, so like where I live and I'm assuming where you, where you live too, mm. maybe less so where you live than where I live, but like I live in like red state ass New Jersey. Yeah. No, that's not here. Like it is like. It's where I grew up. That's not like, here. It is the like. You know, Trump signs on the lawn, right. Blue Lives Matter flag flying on the on the post. So, so it's like, I don't feel like a coastal elite even remotely. I don't either, but I think that like, I think there is a tendency just in, again, living near enough to New York or like following the the new like you know just like having friends who like read the New York Times or whatever. Just like this is like stereotypically like what people hate about uh-huh. whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if either of you caught it, and if you had, you would have already talked about this, but it made me laugh when yet another Lottery Pod book had a poop discussion. (laughs) 
A rumble has commenced in my descending bowel, heralding a tremendous dedication. Wild that this came from a novel written in the 60s. <laughs> yes, no, that's beautiful. Also, <laughs> yesterday I watched Triangle of Sadness and Today Babylon, both incredible poop scenes. Yeah, it's the the, the, it's the era of poop. The world has spoken, and what we want is <laughs> like we want more bowel movements because it's something that we all connect with deeply. And you know, Freud, you're saying this as a joke, but it's also no, true. No, Freud's back, baby. There's mm-hmm. no like, mm-hmm. there, there's no contending it at this point. All in all, Egg says, closing out the year strong in February. I had more to say about this book that I would have expected. It ended up being an interesting read. Yeah. Unlike all of Bobby's other shitty picks. I can't believe what she said. <laughs> she did not say that. I've been, I've been, yeah, I've been dropping the ball with, with recommending books to people recently. Uh, but thank you, Egg, for writing. And if you want to email in lottery at cageclub.me, join the Egg discussion. I would love to have like a bunch of emails. We have other shows with, with more emails. We have other shows with less emails. So I just, I'm, I do love that Egg writes in. The, her dedication to the show is greater than either of ours at different times. So. I mean, I fucked up this week in multiple ways, so... You know what they say about that, though, man? Laros catch medlows. Yeah, I guess this this week's crime is to... Uh, do we want to call Matt or do we not want to call Matt? No, nah, I don't like the cover. I don't think it's, there's nothing too interesting. It's just a movie ticket with, with, like, is this... That's designed, like, the scratched out head, right? I guess he's, like, yeah. messed up in the head. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I don't, and then, like, it just... It's kind of cool. Like, it's striking. Like, the one thing I do appreciate about reading a book is I was reading this in the airport, and I'd be like, look, I'm reading literature... As opposed to like Kindle, like you'd be reading whatever smut on your Kindle you want, right? But yeah. have you read next book, All the King's Men? No. Have you seen the movie? No. Have you read A Confederacy of Dunces? Yes. Okay, so you've there's one. Okay. At Lottery Pod on Twitter and Patreon. Don't support the Patreon. And <laughs> there might be an audible thing. I think I got rid of the audible thing. I don't know. Just keep reading. Yeah, uh, the crime is um, misidentifying someone. <laughs> someone's race and then being uh and then, and then being like sort of condescending about it on a podcast i the, think there was a point where like the crime was supposed to be, was going to be something that you have done and then you, you've gotten on uh, maybe you haven't gotten away from that i feel like you've gotten away from that but now we are back baby <laughs> yeah no i commit the crime that we're, we do i commit every single day cool yeah you misidentify someone's race every single day yeah i'm, I'm a bad man keep reading yeah.